This time, Michael and Ruth arrived in the snowy lands of Alaska. Their snowmobile broke down unexpectedly. Walking into the snowy expanse, each step left a deep imprint. They cut the tracks off the snowmobile and tied them to their shoes to make snowshoes. It was early spring. The daytime temperatures were bearable, but at night, they dropped below freezing. The second issue was food. The area only had bare trees, and the animals were still hibernating. As for water, eating snow was sufficient. Ruth thought eating snow would lower their body temperature. But Michael, drawing on his experience, told her that it helps maintain body heat and prevents sweating and chills. They stood on high ground, which made it easier for passing pilots to spot them. They also planned to build a shelter. The sled was dismantled, and its parts were used to make shovels. They used these shovels to pile up snow. Ruth rolled on top of it to compact the snow. The two decided to start by making a fire. Starting a fire by friction was difficult in this weather, so they ignited the sled's fuel. Now they could begin digging their temporary dwelling. Michael dug a hole big enough for both of them to lie down. It was already 10 p.m., but the sun had just set in Alaska. After 16 hours of continuous physical exertion, they were exhausted. Although the fire at the entrance provided some heat, it was still cold. Ruth worried it might collapse and bury them. Michael used a dismantled fan cover as a container and melted snow over the fire to pour into it. Ruth used an oil tube as a straw, saying it was more sanitary, but it tasted of gasoline. Michael spotted some birch and red pine trees. The inner bark of these trees was edible, though bitter. Native Americans had once survived on this. To improve the taste, Michael toasted it over the fire, making it crisp like chips. However, this small amount of bark was not enough to fill them. Michael decided to go fishing in the river. Due to rising temperatures, the snow was softening and the snowshoes were less effective. Ruth slipped and slid like an eel. Suddenly, she screamed as the snow shifted, nearly causing her to fall through. Michael chopped a stick, tied a line to it, and used a stolen feather as bait. He cast the makeshift fishing rod, but it hooked onto an iceberg instead. Ruth had to go down personally to untangle it since it was their only fishing rod, but their efforts went unrewarded, and they returned empty-handed. That night, they returned to the snow cave, but large chunks of snow had already fallen off. They barely made it through the night. The next day, Michael remembered there was an airport nearby. They decided to head there, using a fungus to make a portable firebox. They followed the snowmobile tracks toward the airport. Michael's body started to sway as his strength waned. After several hours, they reached a small creek. Michael struggled to cross and collapsed in the snow on the other side. After a moment of calm thinking, he told Ruth they had to stop. Reaching the airport was no longer possible. He took the firebox from Ruth, found some leaves and started a fire. The warmth was comforting. They then cut some branches to make a shelter and spent another night huddled together. In the morning, the last flame had died out. Michael felt he had reached his limit and could not make it to the airport. Reluctantly, they decided to give up on the challenge. After announcing their failure, the cameraman immediately contacted the crew, who brought sleeping bags and started a fire. Twenty minutes later, a helicopter arrived, and they were saved. If this had not been a challenge, they might have disappeared in the forest like others before them. This marked the end of the challenge. Michael and Ruth were camping in the remote northwestern part of Louisiana. They faced the worst forest fire in 20 years. With over 100,000 forest fires occurring annually, they knew the risks but still entered the forest. Unfortunately, a fire broke out. Michael rushed into the tent to save items, but most equipment was burned, and he could only save some tools. Knowing fires spread with the wind, they moved perpendicular to it and kept an eye on the dense smoke. The two raced against the fire and reached a mud pond, their campsite for the night, where they could jump into the water if needed. By early morning, the fire had caught up, spreading rapidly. They quickly grabbed their bags and fled as the fire engulfed the trees. After walking for about two hours, they found another mud pond. They planned to boil pond water for drinking, surrounded by raging fires. Surprisingly, Michael started a fire with a lighter. As the wind shifted, he used a counterfire strategy, directing the fire towards the ongoing wildfire. Ruth quickly extinguished the fire on their side, preventing it from spreading to unburned areas. This allowed the fire to burn towards the forest fire until the fuel was exhausted, creating a safety zone. However, a thick smoke emerged, 
indicating a larger, faster-spreading fire, forcing them to leave immediately. But they encountered a ring-shaped fire that surrounded them. Trapped by flames on all sides, they stayed put but didn't give up. Fortunately, the forest had many mud ponds. Mikkel used these damp materials to build a fireproof shelter. Before the fire approached, he dug a deep pit, wetted wood, and made a standalone base with branches and a crossbeam for insulation, then covered it with pine-mixed mud. The mud protected them from the fire and insulated against the heat. After finishing the mud cover, dense smoke reappeared with the fire 150 meters away. Michael prepared another safety ring for double protection. They rolled in the stinky mud pond to lower their body temperature, prevent burns, and keep their clothes from igniting. After these preparations, they hid in the mud shelter. The dense smoke darkened the sky, and Ruth's eyes teared up from the smoke, causing lung pain. Her biggest concern was whether the huge pine trees would fall and crush them in the fire. The fire eventually extinguished, and they succeeded but were exhausted. They decided to rest and start a fire on the spot, which Michael said would be the easiest fire to start this time. On the third morning, it started raining. They took shelter in a hut, cold and wet from the weather. Now that the danger had passed, they prepared to head to the nearest town, despite many trees having fallen around the pond. Suddenly, Michael excitedly shouted for Ruth as he found a charred armadillo, which would be their first meal in three days. However, Ruth refused to eat it, pointing out that armadillos are the only other animals besides humans that can contract leprosy. With no other options, Michael started a fire and planned to make a cup of pine needle tea, Ruth's favorite wilderness drink, before she returned. They skewered the meat and grilled it. Days of fleeing and fatigue were finally put aside. It was Ruth's first time eating this. It was very fatty and somewhat tasted like crocodile meat. On the fourth day, they left the campfire as it was, making three arrow signs with wood and pine branches, and set off towards the town. Suddenly, Ruth's leg got entangled in a vine. With a gentle tug, a charred tree fell, fortunately missing them. Soon, they heard the sound of chainsaws nearby and excitedly made their way through the tangled branches, finally seeing a group of loggers. They were saved. This episode concludes with the couple mimicking tourists who were stranded at sea for a day due to a boat malfunction. They found themselves in the notorious Bermuda Triangle, a region with a history of numerous ship and plane disappearances. Michael could still see the reefs, indicating they were still on the continental shelf, no more than 20 miles from the coast. Staying on the boat and waiting for rescue was the best course of action. The boat owner would surely come looking for them once he noticed their overdue return. Their immediate task was to inventory the boat's supplies. A bottle of water, a knife, a hand fishing kit, a waterproof tarp at the bow with the rainwater inside it, and some leftover raisins. After checking these supplies, Michael, feeling seasick, forced himself to stare at the horizon to prevent vomiting and dehydration. Once he felt better, he and Ruth rigged the tarp as a sail hoping to use the sea breeze to push towards land. The boat was barely affected, and instead they suffered under the harsh sun. Worse yet, at some point, six or seven sharks appeared beneath them, somehow sensing their presence. Now their only option was to maintain their balance to avoid being knocked into the sea and becoming shark food. The first day passed in tension and unease. At night, the temperature dropped sharply, and they used the waterproof tarp as a blanket to keep warm and sleep. On the second day, they had only a little water left. Ruth rummaged through a trash bag and found another bottle with some water left, totaling about 80 milliliters. Besides drinking, they now also had to consider food. Seafood was the only option. Ruth, being a better swimmer, volunteered to go into the sea to find something for bait. Michael stayed on the boat to look out for sharks, while Ruth dived in search of food. She eventually found a large conch and extracted its meat which was plentiful enough for both eating and using as bait. Ruth enjoyed the conch, describing its taste as sushi with a layer of mucus. They ate part of it and cut the rest into slices for bait. With no sharks nearby, Michael used the conch meat as bait and caught a green fish. The liquid in the fish's eyes was a source of fresh water. They quickly drank the black juice from the fish's eyes to hydrate. The meat was eaten raw. After catching a few more fish, Michael tied the leftovers to a rope and submerged them in the sea to keep them fresh. Unexpectedly, this attracted sharks. Although Ruth spotted them in time, one shark lunged and bit the fish on the rope. Michael struggled with the shark, almost pulling it onto the boat, 
but the shark eventually bit through the rope and ate the fish. The greater concern now was their dwindling fresh water supply. Michael recalled the box of raisins found during their inventory check. These raisins had a thin film on their surface that could absorb water while blocking salt when immersed in seawater. They just needed to cover the bucket with a lid and wait for the raisins to absorb water. By the third day, the raisins had fully expanded. Now, Michael and Ruth needed to squeeze them dry, but the amount of water was still insufficient. Michael decided to build a solar distiller using half a soda can as a water collector and a plastic bucket with a cloth strip soaked in seawater. They covered the top with plastic film and placed a weight in the center to channel the condensation into the can. After setting up the distiller, Michael collapsed from heat stroke and dehydration. Ruth used seawater to cool him down and set up a waterproof cloth as a sunshade. The water produced by the solar distiller was very limited and not enough for a person suffering from heat stroke and dehydration. Michael insisted Ruth drink it while he resorted to a last-ditch hydration method. They collected dirty rainwater from the front of the boat. Michael had Ruth administer an enema using a fuel hose with a squeeze pump, cleaned with seawater. They applied sunscreen lotion to the hose tip. Michael's intestines could hold up to a liter of water, from which he could absorb some. The rest would be expelled. After this ordeal, Michael felt somewhat better the next morning. He resumed fishing for breakfast but a shark stole his catch again. By noon, a rescue plane appeared, ending this episode of their challenge. In this episode, Michael and Ruth ventured into the Amazon rainforest in Colombia. They simulated a scenario where they rented a local villager's canoe for a short trip in the flooded rainforest and accidentally got lost. Michael planned to find a river and follow its flow to the wider Amazon for rescue. However, due to flooding, the forest floor was submerged and they had to paddle in a chosen direction to search for open waters. Upon reaching an open area, Michael checked the boat's supplies and found a filled water bottle, a packaged mosquito net, and a fire-starting kit left by the boat captain. The couple continued paddling, hoping to find land to camp on before dark. Along the way, they had to be vigilant of snakes, insects, and ants falling from trees to avoid getting bitten. Michael used dead reckoning to avoid circling back in the same area. After hours of paddling, both were exhausted and hadn't seen any fruit trees. Michael chopped into a rotten log and found a fat grub, followed by three rhinoceros beetle larvae from the wood debris. Since they couldn't make a fire, they had to eat them raw. Michael showed Ruth how to twist off the bitey heads and eat the fatty, nutritious parts directly. Ruth, after a brief hesitation, chewed and swallowed the larvae, later noting they tasted surprisingly good, with a smoky and buttery flavor. They didn't find land all day. As dusk approached, Mikkel found an area of water and tied the hammock between two trees, covering his wife with the mosquito net to sleep while he stayed on the boat to bail out incoming water, taking turns keeping watch through the night. The next day, they packed up and continued their search for land or a river. It wasn't long before a sudden downpour began. Fortunately, their water bottle was empty and the rain was timely. Mikkel and Ruth used a raincoat to collect water quickly refilling their water bottle. By noon, they finally spotted land for the first time during the challenge. Michael decided to use this land as a base to camp, make fire, hunt, and replenish their needs before seeking rescue. The first step was to start a fire. Since the ground was wet, Michael built a ventilated fire pit with branches to help dry the ground for sustained burning. He used the driest branches from trees without leaves for kindling, and Ruth shaved splinters with a machete for tinder. Michael then took the captain's fire-starting tools and began the fire-making process. Despite having a complete set of tools, the humid air made it challenging, and after 45 minutes of friction, he still hadn't seen any smoke. He quickly called Ruth over for help. Using the cap of the water bottle as a spindle to press down on the drill shaft, he had Ruth rub her hands together to create friction. With the spindle adding pressure, sparks finally appeared. Michael blew gently to ignite the tinder and then they added small twigs and larger sticks to build up the fire. That night, they dragged the boat ashore to use as a shelter and managed to get a comfortable night's sleep. On the third day of survival, just as they were about to activate a passive skill, Michael tied the mosquito net between two sticks to make a net and walked to the water's edge at the campsite to catch fish. To their surprise, the first sweep of the net brought up two unidentified small fish. Fortunately, the Amazon River has good fish resources. Over the next few nets, 
Michael caught two catfish, and they used the catfish guts in the net to catch several carnivorous tiger fish. After a few attempts, they had enough protein-rich ingredients for a meal. They cleaned the fish and cooked them over the fire. The couple eagerly devoured the meal due to extreme hunger, even praising the usually unpalatable catfish. With the intake of various nutrients, their strength gradually returned. The couple had not yet explored this piece of land. They wanted to look carefully to see if they could find a river to follow back to the Amazon River. Michael and Ruth found a body of water. By observing leaves thrown into the water visibly drifting, they determined it was a river and not stagnant flood water in the rainforest. The river was about 200 meters from their camp. To avoid the possibility of losing this spot by taking a detour, they simply dragged the boat to the river and followed the downstream flow. After an unknown amount of time, they heard the sound of a boat's horn in the distance and followed the sound to finally reach a wide river and saw the boat that made the noise, successfully ending this challenge. Andros Island is the largest of the Bahama Islands, formed by coral reefs exposed as sea levels fell thousands of years ago. The island is covered with dangerous limestone sinkholes. In this episode, the couple will take on a challenge here. They were dropped on the uninhabited mangrove swamps of the island, with the goal of heading north to seek rescue where people live. The first challenge facing Michael and his wife was to cross the dense mangrove swamp, because any step might land on a sinkhole, potentially disastrous. Therefore, they had to carefully hold on to trees and move slowly until they found a spot on the ground. From there, they began to cross the entire mangrove swamp and walked until 5.30 p.m. Seeing no end in sight, Mikkel decided they would spend the night in the mangrove forest. The couple climbed up a tree to find a spot to sleep. The next morning at 6 a.m., just as it got light, they set off again. As the trees around them changed into American silk cotton trees, the couple knew they were headed in the right direction. By noon, they finally reached a solid expanse of open ground. Their supply of fresh water was almost depleted. The straight line distance across the island was about 40 to 50 kilometers. Now they needed to pick a spot here to make fire, boil water, and build a shelter, storing enough food and water before setting off again. Michael found a spot under a bush with dense branches to use as a shelter. Ruth went to a swamp they had passed on their way here, pulled out a clump of grass roots, and used the hole as a filter to obtain the fresh water they needed. However, this water needed to be boiled before drinking. Michael found suitable wood to use as a drill shaft and base, while Ruth collected fluffy seed heads and small twigs to make tinder. They used shoelaces as ropes to create an improved version of a double-handed bow drill. Due to the rudimentary conditions, the drill shaft was not smooth enough, and after more than an hour, they still hadn't seen any smoke. This frustrated Ruth on the spot. Mikkel then chose another piece of wood, and after more than three hours in total, he polished the wood to finally get it to produce embers and struggled to start a fire. With little time left in the day to go hunting, Michael ventured into the jungle to find edible plants to stave off hunger. He found a dying palm tree, peeled off the inedible outer leaves, and pulled out the palm heart from the center. The palm heart was crunchy and rich in carbohydrates. On his way back to the shelter, Michael noticed wild pig tracks and a dried-up mud pit on the ground, deciding to try and catch a wild pig the next day. Back at the shelter, he shared the palm heart with his wife, Ruth, who found it delicious. By 9 a.m. the next day, Michael had made the components for a pig trap. He used shoelaces to tie a noose that could hold up to 500 pounds. He went to where he had seen the pig tracks the day before, bent a small tree as a spring, and set the trap at the edge of the bushes using white palm leaves as bait. Once the pig stepped in, it would trigger the mechanism and be caught by the noose. Afterwards, Michael and his wife returned to the campsite and sharpened two tree trunks into spears, planning to actively hunt for the wild pig. Initially, both set out to hunt together, but Ruth was startled by sinkholes and sharp branches around her, causing Michael to lose his temper and argue with her, sending her back to watch the fire. Later, Michael found an animal trail in the jungle, likely made by a wild pig, judging by its size. He followed the trail, and indeed encountered a yellow-haired wild pig. Unfortunately, he didn't watch his step and fell into a hole hidden in the ground, injuring his shoulder. Michael tried to climb out using a tree by the hole, but his shoulder injury made it difficult to exert strength. Until it was nearly dark, Ruth noticed her husband hadn't returned. Realizing something was wrong, she went out to look for him and found Michael trapped in a hole. Both of them exerted effort to help Michael climb out. It was another hungry night for them. 
The next day, they took spears and went to check the trap. Michael eyed the distant vultures eagerly. After approaching the trap, they found a wild pig caught. Michael dragged the pig from under the shade and pinned it down. Ruth held its head while Michael stabbed it in the heart, killing it instantly. They then hung the pig up on a nearby tree for cleaning. The unwanted organs and head were left for the island's vultures, and the rest of the meat was taken back to camp. They cut some lean meat and made skewers with the pig's organs. Michael and Ruth enjoyed the meal, replenishing their strength after days of hunger. Now with sufficient water and food, the couple, full and satisfied, carried the entire pig and headed north towards the inhabited part of the island. By 4 p.m., they encountered a lake formed by sinkholes. Initially planning to camp there for the night, they were lucky to find a fisherman by the lake, ending their challenge successfully. For this season, Mikel and Ruth decided to take on a challenge on Montserrat, a British overseas territory. Since 1995, the Soufriere Hills volcano has frequently erupted, making the southern part of the island uninhabited. Their starting point was directly in the path of the volcano's eruptions, so they needed to leave quickly and head to the mountain opposite to find an abandoned village to camp in. The couple, carrying nothing but their clothes, ventured into the mountains where they found a creek in a valley. With no supplies, Mikkel and Ruth risked drinking the stream water directly. By 5.30 p.m., they reached the mountaintop and could see many abandoned houses on the opposite slope, which would be their supply station. When they arrived, it was already dark, preventing them from checking if the houses were safe. They had to make do with sleeping on a sofa for the night. The next day, Mikkel planned to scout around for food and water sources. Fortunately, the area had domestic poultry left behind by humans. For water, a more pressing need, Mikkel found fresh water stored in plastic bottles and some unfinished rum in the kitchen, left by the evacuating homeowners. They moved the found water and iodine outside, using the iodine to purify and disinfect the water by adding a suitable amount to it. The couple then divided tasks. Ruth went to catch a chicken for food, while Michael tried to start a fire. But the house had many tools left behind that could be utilized. Michael planned to create a fire piston using these tools based on the principle of generating heat through compressed air to ignite tinder. He found a mallet and a sealed steel tube that fit perfectly together. Michael coated the mallet handle with vegetable oil for lubrication, then drilled a hole at the bottom and inserted a small piece of cloth as tinder. Next, insert the hammer handle into the steel tube and repeatedly compress the air to generate heat. After some time, the heat ignites the cloth. Michael uses the spark to light the tinder and then moves outside to start a fire. Meanwhile, Ruth chases a chicken into an empty house and successfully captures it by covering it with a cloth. Ruth plucks and cleans the chicken outdoors while Michael finds a grill and utensils inside the house. They roast two large plates of chicken meat. Michael and Ruth enjoy a protein-rich meal on the lawn. The chicken provides enough food to fill their stomachs and over 1,000 calories each. That night, they have enough time to set up their beds and sleep on a soft spring mattress. On the third day of survival, Mikkel plans to send a distress signal because they saw a helicopter the day before. Although the pilot did not see them, Mikkel guesses the helicopter was monitoring volcanic activity. Today, he prepares to make a radio transmitter to send a distress signal to the helicopter. Ruth's task is to find a car battery in the nearby houses, while Michael looks for wires, a grounding device, and metal to connect the battery terminals. Ruth finds a dusty car battery in a storeroom of a house. Michael successfully finds the other three components needed to make the radio transmitter. He ties the wire on the balcony as an antenna, with one end attached to the positive terminal and the other grounded. By connecting another metal piece to the terminals, Michael creates a current that cuts through the static air. Any nearby antenna can receive the signal. Michael sends the signal in Morse code, hoping the helicopter pilot hears it. Ruth does not just wait. She finds a tamarind tree nearby with unripe, sour fruits. Michael sends the distress signal for over an hour. Just as he and Ruth return to the house to gather supplies and plan for the next day, they hear the helicopter's rotors. They quickly run to an open highland and are successfully spotted by the pilot, completing the challenge. In Panama's Pearl Islands, with nearly 90 uninhabited islands, mostly made of extinct volcanic summits, the couple decides to take on a challenge. They start on a rocky beach, where Ruth deduces from the driftwood and plastic debris that the beach is below the tide line, making it unsuitable for camping. They must risk climbing the cliff in front of them. 
crossing the island to a beach on the other side to plan further. Finding water is absolutely crucial. Fortunately, tropical islands usually have water vines. Michael, leading the way with a machete, also tried to find this type of vine. However, it was not a good start. The vine he cut released a white sap, clearly not the water vine they were looking for. But there's bad news and good news. They found a paper bark tree along the way. The inner layer of the bark of this tree can be easily peeled off and is suitable for use as tinder. Ruth collected some and put it in her pocket. As night approached, they still hadn't left the dense jungle of the island. Mikkel found a large tree with a dense canopy where he planned to spend the night, using branches and leaves to make a mattress. Ruth cleared the ground to check for hidden snakes and insects. While chopping the tree trunk, Mikkel found the water vine, solving their urgent need for water. Because there was no fire, sleeping in the jungle was a torment. After dawn, they cut several water vines to carry with them as they continued towards the other side of the island. With the treetops ahead brightening, the couple knew they were not far from the coastline. Indeed, this was the case. Michael climbed a tree and saw that the beach to their right was suitable for camping. So, they headed in that direction and reached the beach by 2 p.m. Looking across the beach, they didn't see a single coconut tree. Michael and Ruth decided to set up their camp on a shaded part of the beach above the tide line. They had an unexpected find. Michael discovered a row of banana trees by the coast. Unfortunately, none of the seven or eight trees bore fruit, but they were still useful. Mikkel cut the base of a banana tree with his knife, revealing that the trunk contained a lot of water with a hint of banana flavor. He then dug a hole at the base of the banana tree and just had to wait about 30 minutes for fresh water to filter into the pit. Leaving the banana grove, they encountered a beach littered with trash. They found a good coconut among a pile of empty ones containing up to half a liter of coconut water rich in electrolytes and various minerals the body needs. The couple collected a pile of useful materials from the trash and brought them back to camp. Mikkel tied up a tarpaulin to create a roof and laid banana leaves on the ground to separate them from the sand, quickly finishing a simple shelter. As for the most troublesome task, making fire, he had previously found a screw cap and something resembling a roulette wheel in the trash. Using these, he made an improved version of a hand drill. By leveraging balance and centrifugal force, he easily drilled out tinder and started a fire. That night, they had to make do with eating coconut meat, but coconut meat is also a good source of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Day 3 of Survival Early in the morning, Michael and Ruth planned to build a seawater distiller. Michael started another fire and built a stand over it, placing a bucket of seawater on top. Meanwhile, Ruth was tasked to find a piece of plastic from the debris. They cleaned and secured the plastic at all four corners. As the seawater boiled, the steam condensed on the plastic, forming droplets that slid down, guided by a stone at the plastic's end, into a cup below. Now, with water secured, they still needed to solve their food source. Earlier, Michael had found a piece of fishing net on the beach and, with Ruth, set the net in a mangrove area in shallow waters, hoping to catch passing fish and shrimp. While waiting for the net to yield results, they took proactive steps. Ruth searched the island for wild food, and Michael, using found nails, made two spears and went fishing by the shore. He noticed many stingrays in the sand, but catching them was challenging due to the limited power of throwing spears. Whether they would have meat tonight depended on the net. Fortunately, the nets did not disappoint, catching a black, unidentified fish that looked non-toxic and became their dinner. Earlier, Ruth had found an orange tree on the island, harvesting several tangy green oranges. Using these two ingredients, he made a citrus marinated fish, eating it directly soaked in orange juice. They slept until 8 a.m. the next day. Due to the tide going out, the nets caught no fish overnight. Michael and Ruth focused all their energy on catching stingrays. At this moment, the production crew's boat arrived. Michael quickly lit a prepared pile of plastic, creating a large plume of black smoke to attract the crew's attention successfully concluding their survival challenge. In this episode, Michael and Ruth ventured into the San Stodoro Mountains in Southern California to explore for gold. Their donkey, carrying equipment, ran away, forcing them to survive with just an iron rake, a water bottle, a knife, and a jacket. The highland desert environment posed a significant problem with water scarcity. They climbed to the mountaintop to survey their surroundings, 
Michael spotted a dense forest in the valley, hoping to find water there. After a tough trek, they entered the valley. Although they found no running water, there were some remaining patches of snow they could use as a water source. Michael chose a spot on the hillside to make camp. Ruth collected branches for bedding while he searched for fire-starting materials. He found a piece of flint, which could strike sparks with his iron rake. Before leaving, Michael had filled his water bottle with high-proof whiskey, which now soaked the tinder, aiding in easily starting a fire with the sparks. After dark, Michael built two long fires, and he and Ruth slept between them to keep warm and melt snow for water. They survived their first night smoothly. The next morning, Michael made pine needle tea, which Ruth praised for its delicious taste. After extinguishing the fire and packing up, they continued down the valley, breaking branches along the way to leave traces for rescuers. It wasn't until the afternoon that they found a small stream. Michael dug a hole beside the stream with an iron shovel to filter the water before boiling it over a fire. They set up camp nearby in a spot sheltered by large rocks and abundant with acorns on the ground. Ruth collected these acorns for dinner. Michael used a sanitary pad as tinder, sparking it with flint to start the fire. He then went hunting with a helmet camera, hoping to catch rabbits or ground squirrels. First, he killed a wolf spider and stored it in his hat, then spotted a scorpion but found no trace of rabbits or ground squirrels. Meanwhile, Ruth crushed the acorns with a rock to remove the bitter tannins and placed some in a sock to soak in the stream overnight as breakfast. Unexpectedly, Michael heard noises in the bushes, thinking it might be a deer or a cougar, but found their runaway donkey instead. He led it back to camp. Ruth boiled the crushed acorns in a cup while Michael cooked the scorpion and wolf spider, first singeing the spider's hair. They tasted the scorpion first, finding it surprisingly crab-like and quite tasty. They filled up on acorn paste and slept soundly, but were disturbed at midnight by the restless donkey, likely spooked by something approaching in the dark. Michael stayed awake by the fire, suspecting a cougar, and let Ruth sleep. At dawn, indeed, he found cougar tracks not far from their camp, but chose not to worry Ruth with the news. The soaked acorns were mashed and shaped into cakes, baked on a shovel over the fire for a high-calorie breakfast resembling peanut butter pancakes. After breakfast, Michael hurriedly led Ruth away from the camp, aiming for lower elevations. By 3 p.m., their water was nearly gone, and they had not encountered any signs of other people. At the junction of two deep gullies, they tethered the donkey and searched for water separately. Ruth found only rabbit droppings, while Michael found moist soil but guessed it might require digging several meters, thus proving unhelpful. As night approached, they had no choice but to camp next to a rock. This time, Michael dug a rectangular pit and built a large fire in it. After the flames died down, he covered the charcoal with earth to create a warm bed that would provide heat throughout the night. They also built a fire nearby, ensuring a comfortable sleep. However, their fire inadvertently caught the attention of a farmer in the valley below, leading to an unexpected rescue. This challenge, located in the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Montana, which spans 600,000 hectares of forests interspersed with grasslands and largely uninhabited, the couple, equipped only with a dragon-slaying knife, a half jug of water, and a full bottle of bear spray, decided to venture into this area. Michael planned to head downhill to find a stream where they could camp and wait for rescue, knowing that the Blackfeet Indian Festival was taking place nearby and that people would be collecting herbs in the wilderness after the festivities, offering a chance for rescue. Due to the presence of many black bears in the area, they needed to make noise while walking to alert the bears and prevent attacks. They walked until after 9 p.m. With the local daylight lasting 16 hours, managing rest was essential. Michael and Ruth found a flat area on the slope, laid down a layer of branches for a mattress, and took turns sleeping to guard against bear attacks. The next day's plan was still to find a water source, which Michael was confident would be at the base of the mountain. As expected, they found a stream at the bottom of the mountain. The water looked clean, but drinking it without boiling was risky. Michael preferred to start a fire and boil the water. The resources across the river seemed abundant, and they planned to cross over using fallen logs to camp there. Unfortunately, Ruth accidentally fell into the stream, which was very cold as it formed from melting snow on the mountaintop. Ruth quickly risked hypothermia, increasing the urgency for Michael to start a fire. He picked a campsite under dense branches with dry ground and began his fire-making task. Michael found several dry birch branches for kindling. Ruth, in dry clothes, went out to gather tinder to stay warm. 
Michael made a groove in the top of a spindle and used shoelaces to create thumb loops, preventing his hands from slipping and allowing more downward pressure during the fire starting process. The base was simply two birch branches tied together. Ruth gathered some moss for tinder nearby. With the help of the improved hand drill, Michael successfully ignited the tinder and built a strong fire. Ruth warmed herself by the fire, and now it was time to consider food. She found nettle nearby, rich in vitamins and calcium. Selecting the tenderest parts, they cooked them for a nutritious meal. In addition to nettles, Ruth also found several thistles. Although their branches and leaves were full of thorns, once peeled, the stems inside were edible. They tasted somewhat like cauliflower stems. Today's progress was smooth. Entering the third day of survival, Michael decided to move their shelter to an open area outside, making it easier to be spotted than hiding under the trees. However, before building the new shelter, they needed to gather food. Michael and Ruth cut many thin branches and used them to construct a fence across the stream. They then built a trapezoidal entrance upstream, making it easy for fish to swim in but difficult to swim out. Michael also found many small animals like rabbits and squirrels in the grass. He dismantled his shoelaces to create two noose traps. The principle was that if an animal tripped the noose, continuing to move would disrupt the balance of an L-shaped hook, causing a bent branch to spring up and tighten the noose, suspending the animal in midair. During the wait for the traps to work, they built the new shelter. Michael, imitating Native American techniques, stuck long, thin branches into the ground in a circle and tied the tops together. He bound several horizontal branches around the middle part for reinforcement and filled the entire framework with leaves to complete the shelter. When Ruth went to fetch water, she found that their fish trap had caught exactly two trout. After struggling in the river, she managed to catch the fish and killed them with a stone, jubilantly returning to show Michael her catch. Their cooking method was simple due to environmental constraints. They grilled the fish directly on a flat rock. Hunger being the best seasoning, Michael and Ruth were very satisfied with their meal. They each obtained over 500 calories from the fish, though not much. It was comforting. After eating, they still had to take turns keeping watch and sleeping. The next morning, Ruth checked the fish trap again and found it empty. Therefore, Mikkel decided to make a weapon and actively hunt, also checking the noose traps they had set the day before. He chopped down a suitable branch and sharpened a stone with a sharp edge. He wedged the stone into a split at the top of the branch and tied the ends of the split tightly with rope. This setup not only secured the stone, but also prevented the split from widening. Originally, Michael intended to hunt in the grassland with this axe. However, one of the noose traps had caught a squirrel. Since the noose had tightened around its chest, the squirrel was not dead yet. Just as Michael was about to kill the squirrel, Ruth suddenly called out to him. She had seen two people on the opposite hillside while foraging for wild vegetables. The squirrel thus had a narrow escape. This challenge thus came to a successful conclusion. This couple came to the depths of the Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky. They removed their clothes and brought only a knife. Worse, Michael had a fever, making this challenge particularly difficult. Their survival plan was to head downhill to find a river and then follow the stream to find people. The forest hid many cliffs and steep slopes. A slight misstep could lead to a fatal fall. Faced with such terrain, the couple had to take detours. Michael, feeling unwell, relied solely on his willpower to keep going. Along the way, he found some goldenrod plants, whose petals could be used to make tea with fever-reducing properties. He tried some and found they tasted a bit like anise. At this point, Michael had to try to self-heal. By 4.30 p.m., the soil underfoot became moist. Michael noticed water seeping from the crevices in the rocks and guessed it was spring water, not accumulated rainwater, so it was likely uncontaminated and safe to drink. Near the spring, the couple found a protruding rock ledge, a natural shelter perfect for spending the night. Michael and Ruth cut some rhododendron leaves to lay on the ground and topped them with softer magnolia leaves to make a simple bed. On his way back after drinking water, Michael encountered a sourwood tree. Its leaves were directly edible. Although far from filling, they made a decent bedtime snack. After a night's rest, possibly helped by the goldenrod, Michael felt much better the next morning. While Ruth was still asleep, he went out to find edible plants for breakfast. Michael found some Virginia creeper berries, which were red all over with two small indentations on the surface and tasted a bit sour. 
Today, Michael planned not to continue traveling, but to make good use of the clear spring and find enough food nearby to replenish their bodies before setting off again. While exploring the area, they picked up several animal bones. Michael thought they could use these bones to start a fire. Ruth decided to try making a clay bowl to have a container for water. After splitting up, Michael found a bird's nest in the woods, perfect as tinder. Back at the shelter, he drilled a hole in a spindle with a bone and threaded the rope through it. This prevented the rope from slipping down during bow drilling, making it more convenient and less labor-intensive. Meanwhile, Ruth found a small pond where the clay could be used to make a bowl or a water jug. Besides, she discovered salamanders in the pond, which were easy to catch and could provide some protein. Michael successfully started a fire using the bow drill. He then joined Ruth by the pond, where he noticed several water lilies known for their edible, taro-like tubers. Digging up a few could provide a hearty meal. Back at the shelter, Michael tossed the tubers he had dug up into the fire to roast. Ruth caught seven or eight small newts, cleaned them, and skewered them on a knife to grill. While waiting for these to cook, she used some clay she had found to shape a clay pot. After about 15 minutes, the lily tubers were cooked through, looking and smelling like sweet potatoes. Satisfied after their meal, Michael pulled out a small tin box from his pocket. Michael planned to use this tin box to make char cloth. He cut a small piece of his shirt, punched a hole in the tin box, and placed the fabric inside. He then put it in the fire to heat. The fabric wouldn't burn, but would slowly char. The resulting char cloth would ignite quickly, with just a tiny spark. On their third day of survival, Ruth's clay pot, placed in the charcoal, was successfully fired. Before setting off, they drank as much water as possible, filled the small clay pot. Once everything was ready, they set off. The journey was challenging. A path estimated to take an hour on a map could take four to five hours here. In the afternoon, the couple found a nearly dried up pond with plenty of cattails growing in it. With both water and food available, they decided to camp and make a fire overnight. Michael planted some bamboo stalks in the ground, bending them into an arched shape and tying the tops together to create a shelter that could protect them from the wind and rain. For starting a fire, he used crushed tops of the cattails as tinder this time. While Michael was making fire by friction, Ruth went to the pond to pull some cattails for food. The white tender shoots at the bottom of the cattails were good to eat raw, while the starchy roots were better roasted. Now, with all four survival essentials covered, food, water, shelter, and fire, they slept well and woke up at 10.30 the next morning. The water they had brought was all gone, and Ruth's clay pot had cracked. Meikle thought of a new way to boil water from the pond. He asked Ruth to find some stones nearby while he dug a hole near the camp, lined it with his jacket, and placed some grass at the bottom for insulation. He surrounded it with stones for stability. Ruth found a turtle shell to use as a water container. They filled the hole with water and heated stones to drop into it boiling the water to kill any bacteria. Once cooled, it was safe to drink. After quenching their thirst, they continued their journey. Along the way, they picked some poison ivy berries as snacks. At around 3 p.m., they found a dried-up riverbed. Following it, they saw tire tracks left by humans and successfully found a nearby road, completing their survival challenge. Croatia's Velibit Mountains feature dense forests, and rugged high mountains with a complex network of caves below the surface. This episode's survival couple decides to take on the challenge here. During their caving adventure, their flashlight fails, leaving them with only a lighter, a first aid kit, and two dragon-slaying knives. Michael plans to find a breeze in the cave and follow the wind to exit. They wrap their cotton sweatshirt around a knife, pour some alcohol on it to make a torch, and use iodine as water purification tablets to sterilize the stagnant water in the cave. After resting overnight, at 9 a.m. the next day, they follow the wind and find the cave entrance, but emerge near the mountaintop, far from human traces. Michael realizes they are on the densely forested north side of the Velibit Mountains, near a minefield from the Crimean War era. Stepping on one could be very dangerous. After a brief rest, they carefully tread on rocky ground, climbing towards the mountaintop, planning to seek help on the southern side of the mountain range. Upon reaching the top, Michael spots a few beech trees with fruit. The couple eats some and fills their pockets with more. After reaching the summit, they see no signs of human activity or rivers. They decide to head downhill, 
hoping to find a river to replenish their water supply and follow the stream to seek rescue. They haven't gone far when Michael spots a dogberry tree ahead. Normally, red fruits have about a 50% chance of being poisonous, but Michael recognizes this as a non-toxic dogberry. The berries are sweet, juicy, and slightly peach-flavored. Michael also picks many as snacks for the road. The region's rocks are mostly fragile and sharp limestone, making the trek difficult. They finally take a break when they reach a large flat area. Michael initially looks for water, but a grouse eating on the ground catches his eye. He throws a stone at it, but misses. He quickly picks up another stone and throws it, startling the grouse into a nearby bush. Michael and Ruth go into the bush, but don't find the grouse. Instead, they encounter a small, high-nosed viper taking shelter from the heat. Considering its small size and the risk, Michael decides to ignore it and not pursue the grouse further. He opts to make a slingshot to hunt other game. Ruth stays to make a fire and set up camp. Michael cuts a Y-shaped branch and uses an elastic cord from Ruth's backpack. He uses a tag from his pants to create a pouch for stones, making a slingshot. After eating some beech fruits and dog berries to tide them over, Michael begins his hunting trip. After searching, he finds a grouse in the bush and this time, his first slingshot shot hits the target. Michael returns to camp to show his wife their dinner. During this time, Ruth made a fire, prepared their bedding, and gathered some wild thyme nearby to use as seasoning. Michael plucked the grouse, cleaned its innards, and stuffed its belly with thyme and crowberries to enhance the flavor. After roasting, the grouse was crispy on the outside, and tender, and aromatic on the inside. Michael couldn't wait, and started eagerly eating a leg. The grouse was all lean meat with a dense and firm texture. After finishing their last bit of water, they slept until 8 a.m. the next morning. Michael and Ruth packed up their gear and continued down the mountain, passing through a low shrubbery to a steep, rocky slope over 200 meters high. Below the slope were the river and lakes they had longed to find. Michael found a slightly easier path down the slope and patiently helped Ruth overcome her fear. They carefully made their way down and reached a lake at the mountain's base. Without hesitation, they jumped into the lake to wash off the sweat and cool down. Michael quickly filled their water bottles and used iodine to disinfect the water. Meanwhile, Ruth found several fig trees by the lake, laden with blue fruits rich in sugar, a true treasure from nature for survivors. Michael picked many while Ruth gathered them. He then found a small cave at the base of the mountain nearby to use as a shelter, planning to make a fire there for the night. The rocky beach had plenty of dry branches for firewood. Michael walked to the shallow part of the lake to sift through the mud, hoping to find mussels. Their hopes were met as the shallow mud was teeming with freshwater mussels. The couple quickly filled their pockets and returned to the shelter to prepare dinner. They cooked the mussels on the fire, and when their shells opened, they knew they were ready. While waiting, they ate some figs as an appetizer to replenish their vitamins and sugars. The mussels were cooked through in a few minutes, appearing yellow and appetizing. However, the taste left much to be desired. Michael noted they must have absorbed a lot of water-soluble limestone tasting somewhat like mud. Nonetheless, the protein was substantial, so they couldn't be choosy about the taste. That evening, the couple ate and drank well and slept comfortably. On the fourth day of survival, they followed the river downstream, passed through a dense reed marsh, and climbed over a steep, rocky slope. When Mikkel and Ruth reached flat ground again, they finally heard human voices. They approached and found several people camping, marking a successful end to this episode's challenge. This episode, Michael and Ruth take on the challenge of hiking in the Scottish Highlands, one of the least populated and harshest climates in the UK. The couple simulates being long-distance hikers lost in the wilderness. They find themselves at a high altitude with visibility around 50 meters due to dense fog. A strong wind from the west brings drizzle. Michael's plan is to head east to avoid the wind and rain and to find a river at the foot of the mountain. They hope to follow the stream to reach the coast and seek rescue. The plan is simple, but the execution is difficult due to cliffs, slippery wet ground, and low visibility, making it easy to fall and potentially fatal. The couple moves at a steady pace until around 4 or 5 p.m. Michael realizes they won't be able to leave the mountain before dark, so they start looking for a shelter to spend the night. Ruth finds a rocky outcrop that serves as a natural windbreak. Together, they gather more stones to build a windbreak circle and use moss to fill the gaps between the stones. Ruth fills their water bottle at a nearby spring, 
and they use water purification tablets from their first aid kit to make the water safe to drink after half an hour. That night, cramped under one raincoat, they weather their first challenging night in the wilderness. The next day, the weather improves and the fog clears. The couple continues downhill, now able to see a river and a forest at the base of the mountain, though they have to make a long detour to get there. They endure more wind and rain and reach the forest by 1.30 p.m. The area is home to small animals, allowing them to build a shelter in the forest, start a fire, and secure some protein to replenish their needs. The damp ground makes it unsuitable for a lean-to shelter, so Mikkel hangs a hammock and squeezes into it with his wife. They use the raincoat as a windbreak and roof to complete the shelter. Ruth collects dry moss from trees and grass tufts for tinder along with flammable pine resin. This white, pure pine resin is edible, sugary, but sticky and wax-like. Considering the environment, Michael finds it hard to start a fire by traditional means. He plans to use a broken flashlight. He extracts the batteries, removes the outer casing to expose the thin wax paper that separates the battery's terminals. Michael positions a fish hook under the wax paper. Twisting the hook to make it touch the battery terminals creates a short circuit. Then, he rolls up a bandage from their first aid kit, uses the heat from the short circuit to light it, and then lights the tinder, ultimately creating a strong flame. Ruth takes over to keep the fire going. Michael plans to make a bolas to hunt rabbits in the area. He finds three stones of the right size and ties a secure cross knot around them. He then tightens the ends of the three ropes binding the stones, completing the bolas. Michael searches for areas with rocks and dense bushes where rabbits are likely to burrow or forage. After an unknown period of searching, he finally spots rabbit tracks. He swings the bolus, gathering momentum, and throws it, but misses by a slight margin. Michael attempts to chase, but cannot run as fast as the rabbit. Continuing the pursuit, he finds the rabbit hiding in a grass pile beside a stone. This time, his throw with the bolus hits the target precisely. Ruth takes the rabbit to the river to clean it, then skewers it on a branch and roasts it over a fire. After half an hour, the rabbit is cooked and looks appetizing. Michael and Ruth tear off a thigh and start eating. Rabbit meat has much lower fat content than other meats, offering a chewy, firm, and aromatic taste. On the third day of survival, considering there are no trees by the seaside, Michael packs a bundle of firewood to take with them, hoping to reach the coastline by following the river. They come across a spot in the river with shallow water, a good place for fishing. They fold the hammock to minimize the mesh, and both hold it in the middle of the river. After some waiting, they actually catch a passing fish in the hammock. Unable to make a fire, Michael and Ruth eat the trout raw. By around 2 p.m., the couple successfully reaches the coast but finds it completely deserted. With no other options, they decide to walk along the coastline. After several more hours, they find a cave above the tide line with a man-made stone hut inside. Michael decides to make use of it and they spend the night there. He stays to make a fire while Ruth goes to the shore to find food. There are many cap shells on the rocks at the beach, feeding on algae growing on the rocks. Ruth also finds scallops, which are easier to pick. In no time, Ruth fills a water cup and a hat with seafood and returns to the cave. Michael, repeating his earlier method, starts a fire using a battery short circuit. They roast some of the mussels and cap shells and boil others in seawater, enjoying two different flavors of seafood. Both the mussels and cap shells are chewy. They have a hearty meal and sleep comfortably in the stone hut in the cave. At dawn, they continue walking along the coastline and encounter a family of three, marking the end of this challenge.